What's up everybody? Hope everyone is having a great day. I'm Anthony. On today's video, I'm going to talk about a very underrated skill, skill that not a lot of people talk about, and one of those that could potentially save your butt if you ever needed it. Now, I'm not going to tap dance around the ring over here, okay? I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's seed saving. Now, before you close off the video, let me explain something real quick. I'm not talking about the seed saving that you do every single week going to the sperm bank. I'm talking about legit seed saving from food that you may be growing in your garden right now. A lot of people think of this as a skill gone by the wayside because we have seed companies galore we have starts that you can get at walmart lowe's tractor supply all the box stores sell seed starts so they sell transplants you can go by 90 percent of most of those places that even sell seeds and they're most likely going to have transplants in the spring so why am i talking about saving seed well there are four main reasons why you are going to want to save your own seed now number one is going to be the most obvious and that is going to be food security by being able to save your own seed you are going to make sure that regardless of what happens you are always going to have yourself seeds to grow next season okay a lot of times people take for granted that you can go out and buy stuff buy seeds everywhere go buy them online and have them delivered to your house but what if we're in a situation where you can't do that are the seeds that you currently have going to suffice for what's going on and what happens when you use those seeds are you going to only grow things that you have an obvious seed these are the questions that you have to ask so if you know how to save seed from quite a few different varieties of plants you are only going to be better for it number two i'm going to go ahead and speak to the people with a little bit of capitalism in their brain and uh, it's like printing your own money Saving seed means you don't have to go out and buy any more seeds. So not only are you saving money, but you might actually be able to capitalize on the fact that you can see competitors out there selling a pack of 50 seeds for $4 and you could cut that price in half, grow a whole bunch of plants that put out seed anyway, put 100 seeds in a pack and sell it for the same price or put the same amount of seed in and sell it for half price. And I guarantee you, you're going to sell out before they do at the store. All right, so number three is going to be one that a lot of people don't realize because they don't save their own seed. But if you did, you would understand that the more you save, the longer the generations you may use, that seed is going to be much better for it. A lot of times people like to go and just buy seeds from the grocery store, big box store, whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. But that seed could come from anywhere. I personally live in South Carolina. I could be buying seed that's coming from Washington State. I could be buying seed that's coming from Colorado or New Mexico in a mountainous climate. How do you think those seeds are going to perform in the hot, humid, buggy south? Probably not as good as they could. So what you do is you buy those seeds, something that's heirloom or at least open pollinated. You buy those seeds you grow them in your garden say whatever it is we'll say a bell pepper you take that bell pepper you take the best bell pepper that comes off that plant and you save that seed the following season you take that seed and plant it congratulations that plant is going to be that much better growing in your climate do it again the following year now once you get to about three years removed i guarantee you that plant is going to perform leaps and bounds better than that initial seed that you put down because as the seasons have gone by that plant has acclimated to your climate so it understands and it knows what to brace for in terms of heat humidity pests drought that kind of stuff and i have seeds that i've been saving for upwards of six seven years that perform so well they outcompete anything that i could ever buy from a store and now to number four this one's going to be a little bit more niche but it's very important you might be with the savior of a particular type of plant okay there are certain seeds that are becoming extinct yes we have lost a ton of genetic diversity over the years because of favoritism and ease of transport okay have you noticed now that a lot of the watermelons you're finding in stores don't even have black seeds anymore they are seedless varieties it's because they're all hybrids there's nothing wrong with the hybrid plant, but some of these are getting taken too far to the point where they're not even real food anymore, okay? The hybridization process has bastardized these plants to a shell of what they used to be. Now, when it comes to watermelon, there are several different varieties. There are yellow ones, there are orange ones, and red ones that taste leaps and bounds better than anything you can buy in a grocery store. Why? Because the stuff you may be buying from a grocery store is only there because it ships easy and it stays on the shelf a very long time, sacrificing all the flavor that you could have if you planted a better variety. If you find a variety of vegetable or seed that you like 
and you keep growing it for years that could potentially go into decades, you might be one of the only people left still growing that variety. I've, had, I've come across this several times in my search for a lot of rare seeds. Down south, we have lost so much genetic diversity, it's kind of ridiculous. But there are varieties that used to grow easily here that you never see growing anymore. You can't buy the varieties in stores, so you have to hunt down very small markets to find that seed still because again, a lot of times these GMO crops are taken over and the heirloom or open pollinated varieties are falling by the wayside. So genetic diversity is a huge one that not a lot of people consider unless you've been growing food for quite a while. So now we're gonna get into the good part of the video. I wanna show you some of the seeds that I've saved that not a lot of people know how to save because it's not done very often or it's not very easy, all right? Not everything can be something as simple as a pepper plant where you cut open a pepper and take one of those seeds off and save it. There are things that aren't as simple as opening up a watermelon or a butternut squash and pulling out a seed and saving it, all right? Sometimes you gotta do a little bit more work, take a little bit more time investment to get these seeds. Now, when it comes to corn, Everybody knows what corn looks like on a plant. Everyone knows what corn looks like on a cob because you're used to eating sweet corn. When you're saving things like filled corn, it's super duper easy. All you do is you save that corn. My personal opinion, you need to be saving it on the cob because the cob is what keeps that corn dry. Once you take it off the cob, it's going to be very susceptible to uh, like mold and mildew, especially in my climate with humidity. So if you can keep it on the cob, that corn stays dry. Now when it comes down to things like green beans, a lot of times you're eating the immature seed of the plant. So you can't take a green bean that you may get out of a can or something that you're, you know, you're used to seeing snap beans you know, on your porch with your grandma. You can't save those seeds because those seeds are too immature. You have to let the seed completely ripen to the point where it's shaking inside that shell. That's a certain variety as well. And it's very easy to do once you've done it one time. But a lot of times when you see things in a store, unless it's a dry bean, it's not going to be a mature seed. So you have to keep that part in mind. Things like beans need to be a mature seed in order to make sure that it can germinate. Next we're talking about things like cucumbers and tomatoes, things with a little bit of a jelly-like substance around those seeds. That has to be fermented. You can try to take them and rinse them off, but that jelly is going to make sure that it stays on that seed. The whole purpose of that, the design and idea behind that, is so when an animal eats the seed, the jelly-like substance will be digested, but the seed will be excreted through the, the, the poop. So that way that the plant can propagate. That's its own method of self-preservation. So if you can ferment, like if the, the tomato fell on the ground or the cucumber fell on the ground, it's going to most likely ferment. There's going to be mold and mildew and fungus that's going to attack that fruit. Well, once that happens, that jelly-like substance is going to be fermented off the seed. So that seed is going to be ready to go in terms of going in the ground and making another plant. If you've ever thrown tomato seeds or cucumber seeds in a compost pile, you know because you're going to get a whole bunch of volunteers because once the compost takes off that jelly-like substance, you're going to be able to get the seed. I'm going to show you how to do that inside your house very easy. All right, for most seeds that are encased in a jelly, just like this cucumber and tomatoes, all you're gonna to wanna to do is take those and put them into a bowl with some water. After a few days, that water should start to ferment, smell kinda of stinky, and when you reach in to grab the seeds, there's no more jelly around those seeds just like this. So now all you gotta do is dry this off and package it away in your paper or glass jar. All right, now what about things like carrots or other root crops? Do you know how carrots produce seed? Because I guarantee you, you can go buy carrots all you want to right now, cut them up the middle like you're used to, and you will never find a carrot seed inside that carrot. So how do you get carrot seed? Well, it's very simple. Carrots are biennials, meaning they don't do their life cycle in one season like an annual plant does. They go biannually, meaning every two years. So what you have to do is you have to plant that carrot one year, wait, leave it in the ground, it's gonna send up another shoot that's going to have its flower. When you get that flower, that flower is going to be pollinated and then that's going to turn into the seeds. It looks a little something like this. This is a carrot flower, or I should say several flowers because all of these are basically hundreds of flowers. And you're gonna see as it starts to advance, maybe like right here, this is a little bit further advanced, you're gonna see all those flowers turn into seeds. So all those little green specks with little legs on them are seeds. Wait till they turn brown, then harvest. A secret to try to get carrots quicker is if you plant them in like my, my climate, I can do this because I'm in zone 8A, but if you're in a colder climate, you might not be able to do this, but you should be able to if you are in a warmer climate like mine. You can plant those carrots in the fall, okay? When you go through the fall, don't harvest them. They're going to get to the point where you can eat them right around November, December. Just leave them in the ground, okay? Then when that following spring happens, it's going to think a year has passed when in reality only three or four months have passed. So you 
wait and come March, April, it's going to send up a shoot with the flower. So instead of waiting two years, all you really did was wait a year, but you got two full seasons out of it, or at least a change in seasons. So the plant thinks, hey, two years has gone by. So congratulations, you just got carrot seed much quicker than waiting a two solid years. Now we're gonna talk about one that not a lot of people know about, and that's going to be cabbage. Cabbage, much like carrots, are a biennial plant, meaning you have to wait that two years. This is one thing that I like to do in my spare time if I have a little spare spot in the garden. I like to wait it out, and I like to wait to see what happens to how these you know plants propagate, how they produce flower, how the seed comes about, uh, because I want to make sure that I know how to save seed. So what I did last year is I planted five cabbage because it was a, a new variety that I was trying out. All right, worked out great, worked out excellent, better than I could have ever hoped for because it's a southern variety. Well, I let that seed, or I let that cabbage go on one plant. It looked like this. After it reached past its prime, you started seeing a little bit more insect damage happen. That's fine, just let it go. And then all of a sudden, it turned brown and gray and looked kind of nasty. Well, that following year, you saw a whole bunch of side shoots come up. Those side shoots turned into their own little tiny individual cabbages. It looked like this. And all I had to do at this point was wait because those little tiny heads of cabbage decided to send up their own individual flower stalks. And it was a very beautiful flower, it was very big and sprawling, and the flowers looked like this. Then slowly as the heat started getting to it, those flowers turned into pods, and those pods looked like this. And finally, it was time to harvest those pods. The funny part about those is when you harvested those pods, they wanted to automatically open whenever you touch them. So you have to make sure you're kind of staying on top of this plant because this, things like this and broccoli and others in the, in the cruciferous family, they all do the same thing. When you touch these pods, if they're already dry, they're going to want to split open and send seed down to the ground. That's how they can reproduce as quickly as they do. So what I ended up doing was I ended up cutting off the entire stalk and just touching the pods over a container to actually catch all the seed. And this is where it gets interesting. Look at all the seed that I'm able to get from one cabbage plant. This is the point I'm trying to get at. One of those seeds made one of those plants. One of those plants literally made hundreds of seeds. You can take those seeds and you can sell them, give them away to, to neighbors, family, friends, whoever, or use them yourself. So I could potentially off of just one cabbage, grow an entire food plot full of cabbage. So if I wanted to hunt deer using that seed, I absolutely could do so. If I wanted to grow that cabbage for market, I could absolutely do so without spending any money. And that is where this video starts to circle back to why you should be saving your own seed. Whatever your motivation might be, of the four I mentioned or others, there is your reason why you should be saving seed. It's a very underrated skill. If you, I mean, you don't have to do every single vegetable in your garden. You don't have to do that. But if you do one per season, you could help yourself at least learn and know how to do it because knowing how to do it is going to help you if we ever fall, our, fall into a situation where we become food insecure, okay? No one wants to be food insecure and if you can see it happening from the long way out and realize I can save my seed and hide my seed or use my seed, then that's going to make everything a little bit easier for you. So hopefully, by being able to show you some examples of how to save your own seed, this video is going to help you become a little bit more food secure. Now before I end the video, I want to make sure that I can answer a few questions that I know I'm going to get to make sure that you are on the same page as I am in terms of knowing how to save seed. Now what is the difference between a heirloom seed and a hybrid seed? Well, an heirloom seed is basically an open pollinated variety that you get whenever you plant the seed from that fruit that you may get, fruit, whatever, and you can plant it directly from whatever you got it from and it's going to be identically the same kind of plant, okay? Heirloom just means it's been around for over a hundred years. So that's been around long enough to where people recognize it, okay, that's an heirloom variety because it's been around since the early 1900s. Hybrid seeds are where you take plant A and plant B to make a hybrid plant, we'll say plant C. So then you take that plant and whatever you happen to get from it, tomatoes, cucumbers, whatever, and you take the seeds from that plant and you plant it, it's going to come up not as a plant C you know, clone, but as something that resembles kind of plant A, or maybe even resembles plant B, but tastes like plant A. Or maybe even it comes out looking like plant C, but it's sterile and the seeds don't germinate. So hybridized seeds, 
they don't always work out the way you want. Yeah, you can get some cool stuff by hybridizing things, but you can also get things that don't work out well for you. So if you're planting a hybrid seed, you just know that it's almost like you're, you're, you're playing a, uh, a game of who knows what's gonna happen. Now, another question I'm probably gonna get is how long does certain seeds last in storage? Well, some seeds can last decades. Others last two years, like corn. Corn does not last very long, two to three years max. Okra lasts maybe one year. I get problems with just germinating after saving my, my okra from one season. So you constantly have to use that one. But here's a little handy chart to maybe help you. You can go ahead and pause the video and take a screenshot, whatever, so you can see exactly how long some of your seeds should last. Now, most of those numbers are gonna hinge on how you store the seed. If you store it in cool storage, if you store it cold, if you store it out of sunlight, out of moisture, that kind of thing. You don't wanna put seeds out like on the dashboard of your truck. You wanna keep seeds in an envelope, a manila envelope, not in plastic, and keep them in a cool, basically constant temperature environment. As a matter of fact, a lot of my seeds, what I like to do is if I do put them in plastic, I'll put them in a little paper uh, seed bag, and then, or sorry, yeah, paper seed bag, and then I'll put it in plastic, and then I'll put it in the freezer to make sure they last as long as possible. Leads into my last question, how do I store my seeds? Well, like I said, you can usually, with most seeds, put them in a paper envelope. You can get these things off Amazon. I'll show you what they look like. Take your seeds, put it in there, and just put it into a dry, cool environment, and they're going to last whatever that length is. Now, can they go past that length? Absolutely. If you have a seed that's generally looked as upon as last four to five years, will they still germinate after six or seven years? Yeah, of course, but you're not gonna get the germination rate that you want. You're not gonna be able to plant 100 seeds and get 100 starts. You're probably gonna get, as those years progress, you're probably gonna get maybe 80 that pop up, and the following year, maybe 50 pop up, to the point where 10 years later, you may only have a handful of plants that pop up from every 100 seeds. So that's like kind of the whole point. Yes, it can go that far, but it doesn't mean it actually will. I know I'm not the end all be all when it comes to saving seeds and there are plenty of plants that I do not know how to save seed from but if you want to check out my friend Old School Prepper up here or down below in my description she also does a lot of her own saving the seeds and she's been doing it for years so she'll show you a lot of the plant varieties that I personally do not grow so if you want to check out some more plants that I haven't discussed in this video please go check her out because I guarantee you she probably has. All right, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and end the video there. I think I've got everything I really wanted to say out of the way. I'll put a few more resources down in the description so you can check those out if you wanna see the full way to store or save a lot of seed. But the ones that I showed you are the ones that I did not know until a few years into this. So hopefully by showing you all that stuff, y'all were able to learn a few things from this video. If you did learn anything at all, please do me a humongous favor and give this video a thumbs up. I would very much appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel if you are not, and I will catch y'all on the next one, all right? Bye.